I wanted to talk about a simple concept that I think you really need to understand when it comes to designing your own whitetail property, uh, even your whitetail hunt. Uh, this could be something that you can even recognize on public land too. And it's something I use with my clients. You know, I use a lot of illustrations with my clients because I'm trying to teach them. And a lot of times just something basic like this can be of great help in the understanding of really how deer should flow through your land and uh, how you should recognize that. Um, a lot of times he's confusing. You know, where do you put bedding areas? Where do you put food sources? And to me, it all begins with food. And so I, I refer to and I compare uh, building your property design to an actual house. And I was interested, I was a real estate appraiser for about 11 years, appraised a few thousand homes up in the Munising area, um, Northern Michigan. And with that, what was interesting is that we went to homes that were poorly built in the area. You know, in general, there's a lot of good contractors, but there were some poorly built homes that featured what I call, what was called in the appraisal world, uh, functional obsolescence. And what that means is um, that the, the house was designed poorly so it wouldn't be as attractive to the typical buyer in the typical market because they expect a higher standard of flow in the home and living condition. And so you had to compare that. You'd always want to have another comparable that featured a, a similar functional obsolescence and then other comparables so you could actually make an adjustment and say, okay, this should come in at 150, but it's coming at 130. This house sold for 130, so there's a 15% change um, that you have to add to this or a 10% change, whatever you found or calculated that you could add across the board. And unfortunately, a lot of lenders, especially the secondary market, they wouldn't accept that. And it's almost like deer. Deer are very picky. And it's not just the way deer use the land or want to use the land. It's how can you build that deer parcel so you can actually use it for hunting. And so let's compare that to a house. And we'll just look at a basic house. And there's a garage in this corner. And something that's very important is that, and I'll, I'll give you an example of functional obsolescence, where you have two levels to a home. So imagine there's a built-in garage and people have to walk all the way through the basement, go up a series of stairs, and then go back all the way to the front of the house to the kitchen. So picture someone in Munising up north in Michigan. It's a, a big retirement area. So let's say someone, let's say the average home buyer, and I'm not sure this what the numbers would be, but let's say it's an average is 55 to 60 years old. Um, there's a large portion of people that are actually retiring in the area. Think about a 67 year old person. I'm 51. I don't want to do this. You pull into a garage and then you have to grab all your groceries, walk all the way through the rest of the garage, the basement, go upstairs into the front of the house to the kitchen. That's functional obsolescence. You immediately eliminate a certain percentage of your potential buyers. We'll take this all out. Now, functional obsolescence could be that, and this isn't the way it'd be built, but so many focus on bedrooms first, so let's stick a bedroom here, and let's, let's stick another bedroom right here, and let's, let's stick a bath right here. And let's say you have to go through this bedroom, once you get out the garage, you have to go into this bedroom and into, through that bedroom to get to the only bath in the house. Doorways right here going into this bedroom again you're going from the garage through a bedroom that's a bad thing kitchen might be on this corner of the house you have to walk all the way through the bedrooms then living room then dining then kitchen that's the wrong way to build a house and i find that a lot of deer properties we're not going to go through a lot of examples of houses because you didn't come here to watch houses but in general you come into the kitchen right off the garage, easy to bring groceries into. You might have a dining room off the kitchen, the living room might appear. You might have a simple hallway where you have two bedrooms. Then you have a hallway bath in a smaller home and then another bedroom back here. The bathroom's easily accept accessible by the dining room, living room area, the bedrooms, and it's a typical house flow. Um, you know, that's Dylan's house. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking of that, but it is. It's Dylan's house. So I've been in Dylan's new home and <laughs> uh, so that look familiar to you then. That's a normal house design. And when it comes to deer properties, there's so many people that mix it all up and there's a typical flow. 
And it's not going to be that your design is going to be the same as even your neighbors. But you have to consider your access. Garage is access, for example. So let's say you have your access in this corner. Maybe your access, another access in this corner. If you're blessed to have two access points on the property, the last thing you want to do is have food next to that access so that every time you walk onto the property, you have to walk through a food source, inviting deer to your access point. That's a poor design. No different than if you have to access the property and walk right into a bedroom. Again, walking right through that bedroom, poor access in design. What's different about a deer property compared to a house is a house you're trying to maximize just about every square inch. You're not creating dead areas, areas where uh, people aren't. Deer property is a little bit different. You want to be able to access the land through unimproved portions. Maybe you have a giant food source here. Well, that means you can't access it. If you're accessing this up here, maybe you have a food source in this corner. You have to consider what's going on around you, of course. In that case, if you have a bedding area here, and you have a bedding area here, you have travel right here, back and forth, travel between these two. It might be that this is a big open field and you think, oh, I wanna plant a food plot here and use a space. You can't do so. If this is a food source right here, you might be able to access to this point, to a stand location. You might have interior bedding right here. You might be able to access in this way, get into a spot. You might be able to come right through here in the middle of the day, get into a point where you blow your scent down. But you always consider, if this is a food source, do I have to access through it? If it's a bedding area, do I have to access through it? Bedding area right here, maybe you could access into this portion and hunt a stand in the morning because deer aren't there. You're waiting for them to come from the food source to the bedding and you're putting yourself in a spot where you're blowing your scent out and away from that bedding so you can get into a stand location. You have a travel corridor in between a couple bedding areas. It might be that you can get to the back side of bedding in the morning because you're not going through the food. You access this way to hunt food sources or go around a food in the afternoon. And it might be that if you're accessing a food source that's right up here in this corner to hunt and you get around here, you get in between food and bedding, that your access through that food plot during the daylight hours is perfect, whether you're coming out or in, out in the morning to your car or into that stand in the afternoon. And then it might be that you access this way to get back out to a pickup point right here. So you're walking through that bedding area after dark, walking to the food source or hunting around the food source during the morning hours. But you have to consider how your food plots flow, match the lay of the land, and most importantly, your access so you're not spooking those deer. There's a lot of homes that are professionally built great architect, put together, have a beautiful flow. There are certain features. When it comes to deer property, there's a lot of bad deer parcels that don't consider access and that alignment of food or bedding as it relates to your access. And when you have a lot of functional obsolescence on a deer property, you're not going to have that ability or even come close to that ability to attract deer, hold deer, build a deer herd, advanced bucks to the next age class. And if you can't do any of that, you're certainly not going to have a great hunt. Make sure you're not walking through a food source, a bedding area to get to stands, unless you're doing it at the right time of the day. Again, daylight hours for food sources, morning hours to get on the back side of a bedding area. Always considering where your wind's going, consider the flow of your deer parcel. And if you're experiencing some kind of functional obsolescence, a lot of deer properties are, I know this is a different concept for you, but consider your home. You might love the flow. Consider how you're building your deer parcel. Make sure that you're avoiding these temptations right here where you could easily allow the deer to pattern you more than you can pattern them because of the overall design plan of your property. You wanna flip that. Make sure that you're giving your ability, you're giving yourself the ability to pattern those deer more than they can pattern you 
because you never know or announce your presence on the land. You combine those deer habitat features together so that it actually assembles morning stands in your bedding areas, evening or afternoon stands by food sources or on the way, and then you have a lot of areas in between, whether they're morning areas, midday cruising locations where you can get into the stand between these, and it's okay to have dead areas where you walk through. I think a lot of times people benefit by a five acre pond on a 40 acre swamp on a, uh, on a large, or on a 40 acre parcel. So you have five acres taken out of that, but allows you to access through it, access along it, blow your scent into it. And that's why different than a house, you're not improving every square inch on your deer parcel. It's good to have those dead zones and making sure that you build a deer property that actually is a working, high-end, easy-to-navigate property where, again, you allow yourself to pattern deer a lot more than they pattern you. Hey guys, I really appreciate you watching today's video. We're out here having some fun today. We're planting some switchgrass, cutting some timber, making some bedding areas, but most importantly, we're putting it all together and that's critical. Any habitat improvements that you're making, you can't just make improvements because it's a good spot. You have to link those together so that it helps your hunt this fall. Really, I encourage you to check out my web classes. The link is in the description. It's helped a lot of folks design their properties and do what we're out here having fun doing right now.